Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. So today we're going to revisit my Universal Smartphone tripod mount. That device has been working great for shooting all these videos, but it's got one small flaw and we are going to address that right now. Okay, let's dive in. So here's the problem that I'm trying to solve. I was relying on the uh, ball joint in the Noga arm to do the pivoting of the camera, which works fine in principle, but in practice, as you can see, the, the weight of the phone can cause it to uh, loosen the mounting bolt. Uh, the, uh, the arm gives the weight of the phone a lot of uh, leverage on that bolt. So uh, here's what I came up with in Fusion 360 to try and address this. It uh, is basically a uh, pivoting joint uh, that has a thread on the bottom that is M6 that goes into the Noga arm, and then it has a, a quarter 20 thread on the top with a thumb wheel that goes into the camera mount. And uh, the idea is that this uh, pivoting joint is a friction, a high friction uh, pivot, and so you can use it to adjust the angle of the phone as needed uh, without having it uh, loosen the mounting bolt. Okay, so we'll start with some uh, scrap brass that I have on the junk pile. This is 360 free machining brass, and uh, I'm turning the uh, pin portion down to diameter. And uh, I want kind of a nice finish on this because it's going to be a swiveling joint, so uh, I'm using a a round nose tool here, kind of an exaggerated round nose tool. It's also going to give me a, a nice fillet at the top of the transition there. Just like that. And now we're going to mark for some of the features on the pivot. And a Sharpie does a nice job of this. It's very satisfying applying Sharpie to a moving part. And then we just set our caliper to the dimensions that we want. This is a really nice trick. If, you, if the end of your part is faced, then you can just lock the caliper at dimension like this and scribe it. Okay, and I'm using a uh, wide parting tool here to make the uh, groove. This groove holds O-rings that form the friction in our spinning joint. And this was intentionally designed to be exactly the width of this parting tool that I happen to have. Now for the M6 threaded area, I need to turn this down just a tiny bit uh, because the rest of the shaft is a quarter inch and uh, we need this area to be six millimeter. So I'm using a very fine nose tool here uh, with lots of stick out because I need an angle and uh, my uh, tail stock is in the way there. So the, uh, the finish will be poor because of the uh, sharp nose tool, but that's okay because we're going to be threading it. And uh, my M6 die, uh, I don't have uh, a, a round one that'll fit my tailstock die holder, so I'm using my hex uh, die wrench here and uh, showing you another way that you can do this. If you rest the die wrench on a block of wood like that, it'll slide along as you turn the chuck by hand. And I'm using my other hand to apply pressure to the back of the die wrench with the tailstock. So if you don't have a tailstock die holder, that's an easy way to go about it. And if your die wrench doesn't have a hole in the back, you can use the flat end of the uh, tailstock quill to apply pressure as well. Looking good. All right, so we're ready to part this guy off now. And Yahtzee. All right, so now we're going to work on the thumb wheel area. So I'm going to face the end of this part off first. And we have to turn this whole area down a lot because the thumb wheel is quite a large diameter and uh, the threaded area above it is a very small diameter. So after we get uh, this faced off here, we're going to have to set up for turning a shoulder. And I didn't do a great job of facing there, but it's fine because this is all going to get turned down anyway. So now I'm using an indicator there to set the depth of my shoulder. You can see me counting the turns there to measure the distance. And then once I have it set where I want, I reset the indicator so that it's just preloaded to less than one turn. And then I set the zero point on the indicator to where the carriage currently is. So then from now on, I just have to go in and touch up on the indicator. It saves you having to count the turns every single time. Okay, now we have a long way to go here, so I'm going to touch in and I'm going to dial in some pretty aggressive cuts here. Probably uh, 100, 100 thou passes, I think, we'll start with. So 
looking good. And I'm using a sharp nose tool here so that we can uh, take more aggressive cuts since these are just roughing passes. We've got a long way to go. And on each pass, as I showed in the turning to a shoulder demo, I'm uh, just touching up at the on that indicator and stopping a couple thou short of zero. And then on the final pass, I go all the way to that zero. Okay, now for my finishing pass. So now I've got the lathe spindle speed turned way up and my feed is slow as it'll go because I've got a really sharp nose tool here and I want a decent surface finish despite this sharp tool. So you can see I'm uh, taking a light cut, feeding very slow and high speed. And then when I get into that zero on the indicator, then I just lock the carriage and I wind that cross slide out and that faces off the end of my shoulder exactly on the zero mark. And I end up with nice finishes and perfect dimensions all around. Perfect. All right, now we need to drill the end of uh, this piece here. This is where the pin goes in. Center drilling. And then we'll just deburr that guy. And clean it out with a Q-tip and do a quick fit up check. Here's our pin and that's perfect. It's a generous uh, slip fit just like we want. I think there's about a five thou clearance there. Okay, so now we need to turn the other end. So I have it flipped around in the three jaw chuck here, which is of course a no-no for maintaining concentricity. So what this means is that the two shafts on either end of the thumb wheel will not be perfectly concentric. They'll be out by four or five thousandths. But uh, this is not a high-speed spinning shaft. This is just a little thumb wheel on a camera mount, so it's perfectly fine. And uh, those flashes of blue that you see there are a piece of aluminum can that I have wrapped around the shaft to protect it from the jaws. And the aluminum can slipped in the jaws. All right, let's fix that up again. So I was taking 100 thou passes there, and uh, clearly I overwhelmed the friction of the aluminum can. So I uh, dialed it back a bit here, uh, tightened up the jaws a little better, and uh, dialed it down to 60 thou passes and a little cutting fluid to uh, ease things along. Okay, so we're going to cut the threads now for the quarter 20. And uh, you can see I'm struggling here to get this thread to start. And this is because I turned that major diameter a little bit too large. So you can see how it just kind of chews up the end there and it won't grab. So uh, now I'm giving it another run, but now I'm applying uh, pressure with the back of the tail stock. And you can see I've got the die holder on a block of wood there, so it'll slide. And that allows you to start a thread when, uh, when you can't do it just with hand pressure alone. And then once it's started, you can go back to turning it by hand. Just sometimes getting it started on the end is tough, especially with brass where it's not structurally very sound and so it just tears instead of grabbing that first thread. You can also just turn it down a couple more thousands. Okay, so we're ready to knurl the thumb wheel now. So we're set back up here with the knurling tool. And I'm grabbing the end again with that aluminum. And uh, again, this, this isn't a, a super strong grip there, so I'm gonna have to uh, knurl it uh, a bit gently. So I've got lots of fluid and uh, I'm turning that, uh, turning that tool in gently. And you can see as I get tight, it's actually pulling the thumb wheel out of concentric a little bit in the jaws, so it's wobbling, but that's okay because we're just knurling. And it looks nice. Okay, so we're set up in the mill now to cross drill the set screw holes that uh, will allow us to set the tension. So what I'm doing here is I'm edge finding on one side and then I bring it back over to the other side and I edge find again. 
and then I use the half function on my DRO and that gives me the exact center of the part. And I've got it set up in a call-up block here which is a very convenient way to hold round things. If, you're, if you'd like a set of call-up blocks there's a link down there in the description. Okay, now that I've found the center on the Y, I'm going to find the end of it using the same process on the X axis. Now because I'm not using the, the, uh, the half function, I just want to find the end. This time when I find the edge with the center finder, or with the edge finder, I then have to uh, move it out of the way and then bring it in half the distance of the diameter of the edge finder, which in this case is 200 thou. So I find the edge, move it up, bring it in another 100 thou, and then zero the DRO, and then my spindle axis is exactly on the leading edge of that part. Okay, so now we're going to cross drill and I've got the uh, number one center drill in there and I'm very lightly pecking it because we're starting the hole on the top of a round surface. So if you're very careful and really give that hole a chance to start then it won't slide off to one side or the other. And having a very short rigid center drill helps a lot too. Okay, so now we're doing the uh, tapping drill size for 256. Uh, the uh, set screws I'm using are 256 thread. So very small, two millimeters for the metric folks. And on the bottom hole, we don't have the advantage of a center drill, but uh, it's being held by the top hole, and it's also a, uh, a concave shape and not convex, so it just kind of holds the drill bit and lets it start naturally. So we can cross drill both at once. And now we're going to tap them. And similar to drilling, we can actually tap them both at once as well, because it doesn't actually matter which side of a hole you tap it from. So I'm just going to tap it all the way through. And with these really small taps, I, uh, I just use my fingertips on the tap branch to avoid applying too much pressure by accident. And then a little test fit with the set screw, and it looks good. Okay, so ready for some final assembly now. So I'm uh, installing the O-rings in the groove there, and I just basically put as many O-rings on as are needed to fill the groove. And we push that guy in there. A little bit of Loctite 242 on the set screws, because the set screws aren't really clamping down on anything. They're just applying uh, a little bit of pressure to the O-rings to set the tension. And so the, the set screws would work themselves loose over time, so some uh, Loctite will keep them in place. So now I just, uh, before the Loctite sets, I just adjust these guys until the tension is right. So I want it to be quite stiff because, uh, as I said, the phone holder has a lot of leverage on it. Okay, so now we can uninstall the old mechanism, which was just a uh, crappy bolt that I rethreaded on one end. It's a quarter 20 bolt that I cut M6 threads on one end. Don't need that anymore. Okay, and I put a jam nut on there and screw it in. And the jam nut will keep this mechanism from loosening the way the old one did, but still allow me to turn the top half with the thumb wheel. So now I can screw that guy back on. Now the real test did it solve our problem. And look at that. We can now securely adjust our phone to any angle that we might need, and it stays where we put it. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it. Uh, please consider supporting me on Patreon, and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching.